Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we are joined by Carmen Garcia, founder and CEO of Community Corporate, an award-winning company focusing on diversity and inclusion. Her social entrepreneurship and advocacy for Filipino communities and as president of the Filipino Communities Council of Australia. Um, before we begin, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land where I'm streaming from. I'm streaming from the Bunurung and Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be um, watching this. Um, if anyone's watching at the moment and you'd like to put any questions for Carmen, please feel free to um, write down on the on the stream and or um, let us know if you have any questions later. Um, uh, thanks for joining me, Carmen. Hi, Danica. Lovely to be here with you today. Um, so uh, one of the first topics that I've encountered um, looking at your profile and your background is diversity, uh, being a diversity and inclusion warrior. Um, so is, can you tell us about your experience as a DNI warrior and a champion of diversity and um, tell us the challenges you've seen and experience um, uh, going into this journey in, in Australia. Thanks. Um, look, it's really, I think it's just a really cool way my colleagues have described advocate. Um, and so the warrior term in terms of, you know, Xena warrior princess being in the trenches. I think one of the things um, many of my colleagues have realised is I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. And although I started um, my career in the strategy space and policy uh, where I really come to life and find my passion is actually working alongside people because of my own lived experience. Even though I was born in Australia, my mum was a migrant from the Philippines and I witnessed firsthand through her experience as a qualified solicitor, her qualifications weren't recognised here in Australia. So she, like many other migrants, had to start from scratch. And that meant, you know, taking whatever jobs were available to make ends meet. And I think I learned very early on that, you know, at the core of human dignity really lies work and purpose. In my own career journey, um, I'm now 42, um, but I did start quite young. And being Filipino, I have the luxury of beautiful skin and uh, not too many wrinkles. So I felt I really faced the trifecta of being, being discriminated against for my age, for youth, for being female, and also from being uh, from a multicultural background. So I think, you know, being able to advocate and speak for people um, and give them a voice and really just draw attention to the inequity that does exist and the unconscious bias that is still very prevalent today in Australia. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's um, interesting to um, see how, you know, as a, as a nation we're evolving in this space. Um, Myself as a, a second generation migrant, um, different experiences, lived experience, and you know have been speaking to people and uh, my sister, my my sister, my auntie, and all the female um, mod role models that I've had in the past have all experienced different types of um, discrimination, and you know being a diverse person. Um, can you tell us now a bit a bit about your um, com company, which is Community Corporate, um, and how you've formed it and as a, uh, as a company, as a firm, how, how has your experience been being a female CEO or a, if you call it a social entrepreneur? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it really does come back to that unconscious bias. And I think just for a bit of context, you know, the, the issue in Australia is when we look at other uh, countries, Australia is doing very well. We're very multicultural and we consider, you know, our diversity a strength. But in the workplace, you know, unconscious bias and decision making is still quite prevalent. And it's not necessarily about bad intent um, or malice. And I think that a lot of um, Australians think it's not that big a problem. And it just fails to recognise that many people don't start at the same starting point. And we, we are operating with, you know, these inherent challenges <clears throat> with diversity, particularly when it comes to work. So when I founded Community Corporate, it was really about bringing together the, the shared ambitions and goals for, you know, a strong and prosperous multicultural Australia between the corporate sector and the community sector and how we brought them together. 
I did spend a lot of time in government as well as in the not-for-profit space and private mm -hmm. sector. And I realised quite quickly that people just don't speak the same language. Many corporates um, are driven with this new corporate social responsibility. They want to lead these initiatives of inclusion, but they don't speak the same language as many charities and not-for-profits. So Community Corporate mm -hmm. was um, established as a social enterprise to really broker these relationships and being a social enterprise it means we operate as a business but we're completely driven by our social value and social impact and how we can um, you know have that collective um, momentum and results by bringing the, the best of the two mm -hmm. together. I think one of the, the biggest challenges as a social enterprise is that um, many people you know don't know where to put us. On one hand we're a business <laughs> So, you know, um, and in terms of even things like um, funding support for startups and scale-ups, you know, they don't, they being government, most government or angel funds, don't really recognise services and how services can be innovative, can uh, really be um, challenging mm -hmm. the conventional way that we do things. Um, they want to fund shiny little widgets or tech or apps or things mm -hmm. like that. So that's always a real struggle being categorised as a business. And then on the other hand, you've got social services and addressing social challenges like unemployment, which community mm -hmm. corporate ultimately does. Um, and then they always want you to be a not-for-profit or you have to have DGR mm -hmm. status. So we do struggle as an organisation, even though we are a certified social enterprise, you know, best described as a diversity and inclusion recruitment company. Mm -hmm. um, but there are definitely many challenges that we face. But personally, as a social entrepreneur, um, I feel very supported by um, an ecosystem of amazing men and women in my life who have mentored me, given me frank and fearless advice, you know, ripped off the Band-Aid and, and given me the constructive feedback that I've needed. And I really feel that... This happened because I wasn't afraid to ask for advice. You know, I think that's my best tip to any female entrepreneur that we often feel we have to do everything. And, you know, really understanding our weaknesses is a strength and being mm -hmm. able to outsource them and bring in people that will save us time and money to do things better and give us that advice is absolutely worthwhile. So I didn't learn that lesson straight away. It took about a year or so. Um, but absolutely now I feel as a female social entrepreneur, I'm very much supported by the community. Um, just to follow up a question on that, do, when you started, did you have mentors or people who you actually um, asked for help or support? And um, are you still in touch with them? And have how, how is your, um, I guess, you know, like giving back journey be became? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think there's there's still people that I met at you know 24 who are still absolutely in my life today. One of them actually became my my mentor, became my best friend um, now, and mm. um, it really it really was about. I think the benefit of being in Adelaide is we are a, a smaller <laughs> city, and th there is a, mm. a, a different level of competition and and collaboration here, like. In Adelaide, we genuinely want each other to succeed. And often mentors turn into business partners. We find these unique connections and collaborations. You know, we want to replenish our own supply chain in Adelaide and really kind of build that foundation. So it's a real reciprocal relationship. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely for me, I felt that that's important that I give back. I still mentor. I started mentoring at the age of 16 Filipino um, students that came over mm -hmm. um, in English. Um, but now I'm still mentoring many new arrival migrants as well as um, female entrepreneurs because it is about the lessons we learnt. And unfortunately, sometimes women can be our worst enemy um, in that we have had it a little bit tougher than some and we forget what it was like in those moments. And I think mm -hmm. sharing those war wounds and letting people know, you know, you, you make the best success from learning from your mistakes. And I think just mm -hmm. really being honest and letting people feel safe to grow and learn is so important. Um, I just want to go back a bit to the diversity inclusion um, um, topic that um, we've, I think, um, started with. It's Is it something that you see in Australia has becoming more, um, I guess, implemented across different le levels of um, workplaces, whether it's, um, you know, management or 
your the entry level are, are you seeing more and more um, companies getting on board in in the space of diversity and inclusion a hundred and ten percent I think you know for some and 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 you Janica being in Victoria you know COVID has presented some ridiculous challenges but it's also created many opportunities with the borders being closed, you know, people and businesses have had to look internally to source talent. So mm -hmm. migrants and refugees who traditionally weren't recognised for their overseas experience and skills are now being considered an amazing untapped resource. And I think a lot of companies are now embracing ways in how they can be more creative in assessing capability, particularly for those higher tech skilled roles. So if you look at engineering as an example, the engineering sector in Australia relied on about 57.3% of overseas, overseas. Uh -huh. to fill these roles. Um, our company, Community Corporate, has been in discussions with Engineers Australia to really look at that credentialing and how can we support um, upskilling and developing training courses to really help refugees and migrants enter the workforce here in Australia and meet these skill shortages. So I do feel COVID presented a great opportunity. Companies are definitely a lot more engaged and they want to be part of a conversation. You know, one of the, the biggest myths, particularly around humanitarian migrants, is that they actually have permanent residence. But whenever you mm. say migrant, many, or companies, refugee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. many yeah. companies assume they have to sponsor them, go through the visa application process. Mm. And, you know, and for some companies, that, that's a really cumbersome process. So I think just having conversations like this and helping businesses understand there there are easier ways, there, there are different ways to assess skills um, and that's what I guess community corporate does in facilitating mm. and brokering those um, innovative pathways. Yeah, wonderful. That's really good to know. Um, um, uh, you can see my the sun in Melbourne is shining. <laughs> um, here, yeah, I, I have not seen a lot of sunshine lately, but today is particularly brilliant for the weather, and um, we're hoping to be out of this scenario that we're in. Um, um, going now, going to a topic which is very close to my heart, being Filipino. Um, you are the uh, current president of the Filipino Communities Council of Australia. Um, how would you describe the Filipino communities in in across the country? And you know, being Filipinos are uh, um, the fifth largest uh, migrant community here. So, um, yeah, can you tell us your experience working with um, the communities? Yeah, it, it's been an absolute privilege to serve as the national president for the last three years. Um, I'm actually the youngest and first Australian born elected to the role. So uh, even though I completely understand Tagalog, Bisaya naturally comes out of my mouth. So that's been a little bit challenging with the elders. Um, but mm. I've been all over Australia meeting with communities, particularly before COVID started. And, you know, there is a real sense of resilience and, and resourcefulness um, amongst our community. But, Janika, one of the main reasons I put my hand up to um, mm. run for president was <clears throat> I really wanted Australia to see there's a lot more to the Filipino community than our food and festivals. And there are so <laughs> many professionals, entrepreneurs, innovators that are contributing quite significantly to the economic prosperity of Australia, but it just isn't recognised. You know, I really do love my community, but my frustration is sometimes we're just the quiet achiever and we mm. don't, you know, sell our story well. And that's really what I wanted to be able to put the framing around the true story of Filipinos. You know, this mm -hmm. year we celebrated our 75th anniversary of diplomatic Philippine-Australian relationship. Right, yeah. And it was a great opportunity to showcase, you know, not just the social and cultural contribution, but that economic impact. Um and, you know, I, I think our values are very much aligned, Filipino and Australian values, you know, in terms of that unity, connectedness and generosity. And I think yeah. we really saw that throughout COVID. You know, Filipino armies of volunteers didn't just help mm -hmm. our own community. They were el out helping the wider community, even in the drought and um, mm. fires, bushfires. There was a lot of fundraising, a lot of donations. And I think that, you know, again, that story isn't really told in the mainstream media. Um, you know, we are the fifth largest ethnic community and we don't have a seat at any real federal or state government decision-making table. Mm -hmm. So one of my key goals was to really elevate our profile. I feel like I got a lot of that done, probably not to the highest standards that I would expect considering COVID did make it harder. Um, but we did um, hope to hold our um, 
2021 Filipino Achiever Awards Ceremony in Parliament House. That was all organised and sponsored. And that would have been the first time Uh that the Filipinos have been honoured in Parliament House. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we've had to move to a virtual event. But I know that there's a real strong bipartisan commitment to really recognise and celebrate these achievements and contributions of Filipinos. So I'm really proud to have moved the marker on that. Mm -hmm. That's really, really good to know. I I have, I I myself am not aware that there is awards um, happening, but yeah, that's fantastic to hear. And, you know, I think that's uh, one of the things that I've also realized is, you know, how to elevate the uh, profile and become more, you know, bolder and, you know, present yourself in a way that you're, you're not underselling yourself. And that's something, you know, some, a, a lot of us would uh, growing up in the Philippines would be in a, having had that kind of culture that you know you're kind of shy, but not actually shy. You just want to be as polite as you want to be as as you can because that's how your parents taught you, not interrupt. You know, but um, that kind of um, you know, cultural uh, comparison that we see here, you know, we we can be as as bold as we can as uh, as migrants. So. Um, I think that's uh, where you know, the networks like women of colour and bringing together strong women to advocate for each other, like what you're doing for me today, Janica, you're helping to tell my story um, <laughs> and making me get it out for other people as well. I think, you know, that's what I would love to see, women telling other women's stories and standing on each other's shoulders. I think the best way we're going to do it is if we do it together. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, also one of the things that kind of this year I have realized, you know, a lot of um, um, movements going on and, you know, the women of color is one um, one part of the entire structure that, you know, we have to be more visible and, you know, as a collective, we've got to lift each other up. So, um, yeah, um, it's it's fantastic to be able to do this in this platform or in other platforms that are available now using technology. Um, just moving on a light, lighter note, um, just want to talk about your um, when you're, you know, when you're growing up. What's your Filipino um, food uh, food that you have uh, grown up with, and can you share some of your uh, moments about, um, you know, your Filipino culture? Yeah, growing my, up in Adelaide, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, my Lola and Lolo um, lived with us, so they raised me, which is why I can speak this out fluently. Um, so my Lola made a mean pinakbet. Um, paired with uh, beautiful lechon kawali was always my favorite. Um, <laughs> yum, yum. <laughs> she, she taught me how to make the pancit and the adobo and the spring rolls. And I now have two children, um, Ashley and Cooper, and they, they're very proudly quarter Filipino and they love my adobo. Um, so we still um, eat a lot of Filipino food and, you know, celebrate that here. And, yeah, food, you know, back in the 80s, <laughs> showing my, you know, my age, but when there weren't food allergies yeah. at school and you could bring food, um, my grandma actually, you know, helped make a Filipino cultural feast with bunsid and spring rolls and fried rice. We brought it to the class to really share our culture. So, you yeah. know, food has always brought people together and helped told our story. And it definitely, mm-hmm. I think, helped me realise our diversity is a strength. And, you know, people just don't know what they don't know. Um, and it's about sharing our culture. And that's what's, you know, lovely about being in Australia. There's so many diverse cultures to mm, Exactly. I guess if you're surrounded by people who are open to um, learning about your culture, that makes it easier to, to um, evolve around people who are, who are in that same um, thinking and environment you're in. And we're happy that, you know, like we're, what, we're, where we're living at the moment is um, a culture that's open to everyone. Um, the last point, um, uh, this might be a, uh, a little bit um, out of your zone, but um, the, in the Philippines, we've got um, elections coming, and I know it's something that you probably um, are kind of aware of or, you know, do, maybe not doing something, but it's something that um, a lot of Filipinos are watching overseas because we've got the, probably the highest number of migrants from uh, um well, not in Australia, but all over the world, we've got a lot of migrant communities. So um, is that something um, that you're looking um, into, uh, I guess, providing some information of, you know, what, what can what can um, Australian Filipinos or Filipino Australians do in the coming elections next year? 
Yeah, I, I mean, as, as Filka, we have a great relationship with the embassy and the honorary consuls and information is always, you know, sent out and shared amongst the communities and the peak state councils. On a personal note, you know, I think if we really want to embrace democracy, the best way to get involved is participate. So, you know, I really encourage people to vote. I used to have dual citizenship, um, but due to, uh, you know, uh, government run I had to forfeit yeah. my dual citizenship so I can't vote but if I could I would because mm -hmm. I think you know at the end of the day we we want to be part of the decision making on the leadership and you know we can't sit here and complain or praise the result if we're not involved in it um, so I really think that's important you know unlike Australia where it's mandated voting it's not mandated in the Philippines it um, and it's not, yeah. that people should really make the most of so I definitely feel um, that it's something that, you know, we need to get a bit more actively involved in. Correct. Yeah. The thing with, um, I think, you know, not being mandated, and I think I'm trying to tell that to friends and family that, you know, here we we have to register and we've got to, you know, say what we, um, like, we, we've got to be actively um, participating in it rather than just be, um, you know, putting through whatever, <laughs> whatever has been told for us to do so um, I think it's good to do some research about who will be um, up and coming and what are, what is actually beneficial for for the Philippines so yeah um, it will be good to um, learn about this space for in the coming months and um, see um, act, uh, active participation of the Filipino community for um, the future of the Philippines. Um, well, it's been lovely um, talking to you, Carmen. I know it's a lot of topics all in one um, afternoon, but um, it's great to um, hear from you. So um, with that, um, thank you so much. Um, I hope to, you know, keep in touch and we will um, let you know if there's any things that we could probably um, get in touch with and share resources or, you know, communications with each other for, I guess, um, part of diversity strategies and the Filipino community as well. Thanks so much, Carmen. Thanks, Jenica. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye.